really, I, I want to kind of just emphasize, as, as previous speakers have done, that there are both costs and benefits to population change and migration, and they need to be managed. Um, what I want to emphasize is that context is everything. We quite often talk about migration as if it's a global phenomena. We talk about large regions and the impacts there. Same with population change. I'm going to talk much more about the UK experience and how it's different in certain respects. Um, that's not to say it's um, completely divorced from all these kind of global changes, uh, because it isn't, very much so. But context is quite important, and it certainly affects the politics um, significantly. First of all, um, just some basics, which we all know. Um, population change, it's very simply measured. It's numbers of births, minus numbers of deaths, and then net migration. Um, and we know that global development is actually leading to a slowing down of population growth over the kind of massive rise that we've seen over the last, well, roughly 100 years, um, as we've seen in previous slides. Um, it's also interesting, of course, development um, initially led to a big rise in birth. That's why we saw massive population growth. It then led people to live longer and has been leading to pe people to live longer over roughly the last um, two centuries. Cons this is a consistent trend. It's even was unstoppable. So the idea that we will all retire at the age that our parents retired at seems to be a pipe dream now. Um, I think we will have to work longer because we are living longer and it's a really interesting consequence, I think, um, particularly for countries like Turkey where they had quite a low retirement age for some large groups of its population, which is now being challenged. Um, and it's also interesting, of course, that one of the other consequences of development that people like Malthus really didn't foresee. Malthus was a terrible, terrible forecast, but really <laughs> absolute rubbish. He forecast one element, you know, births, completely missed deaths, and, you know, since then we've seen a massive change in terms of the movement of people as well, which is really, really significant in those things. Um, so there's always these kind of debates, you know, whether it's Malthus, whether it's Erkman, um, these people are constantly coming up um, with a very fearful scenarios, and you know, and there is some good reasons to feel fearful about change. Of course, it, it is a challenge, um, but they're almost always proved wrong because, uh, as Howard says, I mean, the human human populations are very resilient and, and very imaginative and very good at developing. Um, uh, we've we've kind of gone through some of the basics, and so I won't spend long on this. But obviously. You know, we know people who migrate, they tend to be younger, health, healthier and so on, they tend to be, um, to have skills to offer, um, that's why they migrate, because they can get work. Um, countries who lose population through migration often suffer because they're losing some of their most talented people, of course, um, often some of the younger people, so of course they will quite often grow older, um, and obviously re receiving migrants has a result um, for those countries that receive them as well, and, and countries losing population um, then need to develop strategies to replace some of the people they've lost if they're going to continue growing. Um, the point is though, there are costs and benefits to different populations in different countries, depending on their situation, this, this complex equation. Um, it's, it's not clear that migration will benefit all countries at all times, it's not clear that um, a, a rising population will necessarily be beneficial, it has quite significant costs. It's quite difficult for some countries when they have a very large um, youthful population, for example, it isn't well balanced and a more stable population. So there are costs and benefits. Um, I search Google, as we do, uh, when we're good researchers these days, that's our first point of call. I'm looking for just some, some basic information about these sorts of theories. And I just came across this chart and I thought I'd, I'd stick it in here because it's just really interesting as a, for me, it's a typical, a typical chart on population change and the effects of natural change and migration. Um, I've labelled it a typical case. It happens to be Washington State in the US, but it could be any one of a large number of countries. It's um, complicated if you're not used to seeing these charts, but it's, it's basically over a 30-year period. It shows the population change, which is the, the darker bars, the tall bars, and net migration, um, which is the essentially the shaded area below the the toolbars. And you'll, you'll notice if you've got a reason reading these sorts of things that the difference, which is natural change, is pretty constant over this period. And this is the way we see population change and migration. That for its natural change is almost um, continuous, it's a constant, it's predictable, it's inevitable, it carries on at a constant rate, and the wild card is migration. Um, and that's really what we're seeing here. It's not always like this, though. Um, and I want to give you the UK example, because the UK is, is slightly different. 
This is population change in the United Kingdom. The bars, if you can see them on the chart, the vertical bars, are the change in population over the best part of a century. This is over 100 years. From 1960, from the 60s, it's, it's pretty accurate as a measure. Um, prior to the 1960s, it's, it's a modelled um, measure based on, on changes in population and fertility and, and death rates and so on. But broadly, I mean, what you see essentially is some very significant population growth in the United Kingdom up till about the 1960s, 1970s, um, at quite varying rates. In the 1960s and 1970s, population growth in the 1980s, in fact, up to the mid-1990s, population growth was relatively low, and since then, in the 2000s, it's really sped up considerably um, in the United Kingdom. What's also interesting is, for large periods, the United Kingdom was a contributor in terms of migration. It was not a recipient of migrants, it was a net contributor. More people left the United Kingdom than came there. There were certain periods when we received quite a lot of migrants in the 1930s. Um, a lot of that was, um, for example, Jewish migration from, from other parts of Europe. In the 1950s and 1960s, a lot of um, former Commonwealth countries um, sent a lot of people to the United Kingdom. Um, places like Jamaica, Kenya, other parts of Africa, Nigeria, India, and so on. Um, but actually at that time there was also a lot of British people who were leaving the United Kingdom, going to places like America, Canada, Australia for example. So actually there was a net mi negative migration in the 1960s. And what's important, for that period up till um, certainly the 1970s, 1980s, migration didn't really make much difference for population change in the United Kingdom. The big factor that was the green line, which is natural change. Almost all of the population change was driven by natural change for that period. That's changed in the last roughly 15 years. And you can see at the tail end of this graph, the very significant growth in population we've seen over the last 10, 15 years has actually been driven much more by migration now than it has been by natural change. Natural change is less than half responsible for, for that change over that period. That's a big difference for the United Kingdom. It's, it's a big change in, in our situation. Um, now, by some measures, the United Kingdom is remarkably average. This is a, just a, the proportion of the population that um, net migration represents in all of the European countries um, in, in the mid-2000s, which was the period after the accession of a lot of Eastern, Eastern European countries to the European Union. And the United Kingdom is roughly in the middle. There are some countries, I mean, obviously Cyprus, Luxembourg, they're very small countries, so a relatively small number of migrants can make a big difference to their population. Countries like Spain and Italy traditionally receive a lot of migrants, and that was very much the case then. The United Kingdom is in the middle. Germany is quite, uh, sees quite a small um, proportion um, of its population represented by migration, at least it did in this period. Um, there are various reasons for that, and I think they're, 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 that picture's changing, actually. Um, in the last, last couple of years. And you can see there's, a, there's a, sort of a number of Eastern European countries, Lithuania, Poland and so on, who actually have lost quite a lot of their population, and, and I'll come back to that. Um, but the UK is also quite different in certain respects as well. Um, these are Eurostat figures on, uh, on the left-hand side, we've got the number of immigrants to particular countries in the EU in 2009, and then on the right-hand side it's the net migration of foreign nationals, so the difference between inflow and outflow of foreign migrants. Um, the United Kingdom is at the top of both charts, and actually um, there's some other countries, Spain and Italy are at the top as well. Um, Germany receives a lot of immigrants, um, but it also sends a lot of people abroad, so the net migration figure for Germany is, is a lot smaller. Um, I think this is quite an interesting chart for, in, in terms of European politics, actually. Um, I mean, the European Union traditionally has not been much involved in, in terms of um, the politics of migration and trying to control migration at an EU level, apart from through enlargement. Um, and actually this chart explains why that's, that's not, that's not a, 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 a stupid place to be. Um, because really, um, four countries dominate immigration into the European Union. Um, for the other 20 or more countries, actually immigration is relatively low um, in terms of global EU migration. But of course, in terms of EU politics, you know, those 20 countries that are not seeing a lot of migrants can dominate European Union politics. Um, that has significant implications for politics in the European Union in terms of migration. Um, a lot of countries that want immigrants, a lot of countries that would see, you know, that would like to have 
their borders more open and receive more migrants may not be the countries that will actually receive them if the EU takes political action in that respect. A lot of people from Turkey, for example, they may initially enter Greece um, as a country in the European Union, but then go on to Germany or go on to Spain or Italy or the United Kingdom. Um, so there's a, there's a complication there in, in terms of European politics. Um, this is uh, another interesting chart um, from a, a, the Espon Demifer project. Um, I think it's funded by the European Union. It was a, again, I think I'm not sure if those are the figures that show some of your statistics or not. Um, but but it's, there are a number of projects that try and model population flows, and this is just another one. Um, it, it tried to model population flows, the effects of migration at a regional level across across Europe, and it's quite a complex set of um, modelling. But essentially, the picture it presents is a very straightforward and simple one, and it's really of a two-speed Europe. Um, and essentially, um, the countries and the, the regions of Europe that are um, in red on the map, um, which are almost, well, which are mainly on the eastern side of Europe, um, are countries that will are, are modelled to lose population, um, and the ones on the right um, are, are net gains of population. Um, Spain and Italy, and to a large extent the UK, very strong um, population receipt recipients, um, and. To some extent, I mean, there are other countries, Germany are also a strong recipient. France is a bit mixed, which is quite interesting. Um, some parts of France seem to be a strong receiver of population, other parts um, a net loser of population. So it's a very interesting picture, but it does emphasize that, there, that within the European Union, there is a two-speed process going on. It is very different. A lot of that is simply about population, not from outside the European Union, but population movement within the European Union. Um, and I'll show you an example of that. Um, but the, the point is, too often we regard the European Union as a single entity, and that one set of policy, one set of policies will work for the whole of Europe. And I think my point is that actually that is not necessarily the case, um, in, particularly in terms of migration and population, the European Union is, is seeing some very different trends in different parts of Europe. And particularly that, that, that split between the East and the West is very significant. Okay, in terms of the United Kingdom, just in case you're not aware, um, this is a big table of numbers, you can't read it on the screen, you might be able to see it on the screen in front of you. The key thing to note is the top line, which is Number of um, these, these are the kind of the, the biggest foreign nationalities in the United Kingdom in terms of our population estimates in 2010. Um, Poland is at the top. In 2003, Poland was barely in the top 20, I think. I think it may have just made the top 20. But since the EU enlargement, we have received in the United Kingdom around half a million Poles, or almost 600,000 Poles now actually, have moved to the United Kingdom and become permanent, permanently resident there, or at least resident for a long, long period. Um, I know Germany has received similar amounts, I'm sure, now, but it's uh, um, And that's a very different kind of migration pattern than we were seeing prior to that period. Um, most of our migration, well, a large part of our migration in the United Kingdom since European accession has been within European migration, not from outside Europe. But prior to European accession, that was very different. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite a remarkable change. It is the biggest change in, in population in terms of any one national group that we've seen in the United Kingdom ever as far as I'm aware. So maybe Irish migration in the 19th century was as large, but that was over a much longer period. Um, as large proportionally, probably not numerically. Um, what's that mean for fertility and, and, and demo demography? Um, well, as has been noted, large parts of Europe um, have, have now very low fertility rates. Um, they're not near um, sort of replacement rate, which is over, over 2.0. 2. Um, in 2009, only, only Ireland really was a, a replacement rate. There are some other countries, though, that were at the higher end of the scale. Um, France is and Sweden um, and the United Kingdom uh, are getting up for a fertility rate of, of, of nearly two. Um, and it's interesting, the United Kingdom picture, um, fertility, the chart for the fertility rate for just England is, is that bottom, bottom right chart. And it shows that fertility rates in the United Kingdom dropped rapidly from the 1960s into the early 1970s, and then really flatlines at a, a kind of low rate um, 
for most of the 1980s, most of the 1990s. Um, that basically meant there was, a, there was a demographic gap. We were not producing enough new people um, to fill our labor force as it was currently constituted. Um, and so migration had a lot of value for the United Kingdom at that, you know, at that time. You know, the, the gap in the people born in the 1970s would have been entering the labor market in the mid-1990s. That was exactly the time when migration started to rapidly, rapidly increase in the United Kingdom. It was filling a hole, frankly, in our population. That's, that's, you know, that, that's very clear. Since the 2000s, our fertility rate has recovered. Um, part of that is due to migration, actually, and part of that is due to migrants. We're not entirely. The, the fastest growth in fertility rate at the moment in, in, in England and Wales um, is amongst people who were born in England and Wales, not people who were born abroad. Again, that's a change, that's different, but that's part of the, part of the um, statistical sort of context that we're working in. Um, of course, that means our population is more and more getting to a point where it is starting to replace itself, and the demand for migrants is getting less. Um, now, it's interest, this is really obviously has interesting context, con uh, consequences for migration policy. Now, I, I'm not for one moment suggesting um, that there is a lump of labour. I mean, uh, those of you who have dealt with the eco economics of migration have probably come across the lump of labour fallacy, which is, simply put, it's simply the, the thought that, you know, every migrant that comes to a country is somehow displacing a resident from a job. You know, that there is a lump of labour and it cannot be changed. That's obviously nonsense because the economy has grown. So it's perfectly possible for a economy to be grown and there to be a new job for a resident person and a new job for a migrant. You know, that's, that's the way economies work. So a lump of labour fallacy is there, and we must always remember that, um, because it doesn't mean that there is a simple replacement of residents with migrants. But the number of people in the population, you know, jobs cannot grow infin 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 infinitely. Um, there, is a, there are limits to the rate at which economies can grow, and that therefore the, there is a limit to the rate at which economies can produce new jobs and opportunities for new jobs. So the, the relationship between the number of people who are entering the labour force, um, whether from natural change or from migration, is quite important, and there is a relationship with economic growth. And therefore, if one, fa one part of that equation changes at a different rate from another, that will have consequences for the other. So if natural change becomes more important as driver of population growth, um, that has implications for migration, um, and vice versa. So I just want to posit that, because the situation in the United Kingdom is quite interesting, because these relationships are changing, and they are changing significantly, and that will have consequences for the management of migration and our demand for migrants, notwithstanding all the points that we made previously about a lot of the potential benefits um, of uh, getting innovators, getting entrepreneurs, getting young people within, into the labour force. That's really, um, I think, all I wanted to say, really, is just try to put some of these things in a kind of different more local context, but it has implications, I think, for European politics as well, in a more general sense.